Um, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm a humanitarian, and I'm going to walk you, uh, uh, whip you around the world. Uh, I've spent the last eight years as an emergency humanitarian manager, and I'm going to look at the impact that uh, I think and our organisation thinks that climate change is having on the poor. So in May 2008, I boarded a flight to Yangon, Myanmar, 10 days behind this. Cyclone Nagus had just claimed 140,000 lives, a fact that the Myanmar government were denying. They were embarrassed about how little they'd done to warn their people um, of the impending carnage. Together with other humanitarian staff, I boarded a UN helicopter and stared out the window over mile upon mile of flooded rice fields as we flew over the vast flatlands of the Irrawaddy Delta. The UN Humanitarian Air Service was shuttling humanitarian staff to the small town of Laputa. This was a scene that awaited us. That was as far as one could go before boarding a rickety boat for a four-hour trip south, further south into the delta where my aid agency was working. The red areas um, show the extent of flooding across the delta. Basically, those at the bottom of the delta stood no chance. We eventually rebuilt thousands of homes, schools, public facilities and livelihoods. This is a collective humanitarian effort at great expense to the locals and to the international donors and to taxpayers who ultimately fund them. In May this year, the government of Myanmar prepared to move another 166,000 people in the path of yet another cyclone, shown here on the left. These are not isolated events. Cyclones are bearing down on Myanmar and India and Bangladesh and the other countries in the Bay of Bengal nearly every year, as the chart on the right shows. Natural disasters are on the increase. This graph shows the number of recorded natural disaster, disasters over the last century, even accounting for poor reporting in the early half of the 20th century, the number of cyclones and floods and droughts and the encroachment of deserts, and these are known together as hydrometeorological events, has raced away in the last decade and a half. Warmer oceans are producing bigger, more severe, longer lasting cyclones. The 15 years to 2004 saw a 57% increase in catastrophic cyclones compared to the 15 years prior. Storm surges from hurricanes are on the rise in the US, like Hurricane Sandy, remember New Orleans in October last year. New Yorkers may pay a heavy price, in fact they paid 19 billion for the rebuilding in New York after that um, cyclone, but they can at least afford to replace what gets bold. If global warming is leading to more severe weather events, then in our opinion, it's the poor who are most at risk. Let's consider droughts. The Sahel is an area, a semi-desert right beneath the Sahara, runs right across Africa. The countries that sit within the Sahel were gripped in drought two years ago. Shifting rain patterns have left them short of rain in all but four of the last 44 years. This is the same location overlaid with predicted malnutrition cases at the time. The large dots represent 20 to 40,000 people each. Altogether, 13 million people spread between the Atlantic and the Sudan facing food shortages. Over a million children were at risk of severe acute malnutrition. On the other side of the continent, East Africa was only just emerging from a famine that had gripped Somalia and the surrounding countries. It didn't need to be this way. In some places, aid agencies and locals had been getting ahead of the problem. This is the Ansokia Valley in Ethiopia in the 1980s, and some of you will remember the Ethiopian famine of the time. 20 years later, this is the view in the same valley. Thanks in this case to World Vision's work in soil erosion control, revegetation, irrigation, horticultural training, agricultural training. All these gains, however, could be undone in just a few years of below average rainfall. Sadly, it then takes a famine to fundraise to solve the problem. The calendar here shows the crisis in the Horn of Africa deepening over an 18-month period, with funding for the response only arriving after the UN declared a famine in Somalia in July 2011. And I fronted to the breakfast shows on television and the radio the day that was declared to give it the push humanitarians need to raise money. But by the time the response was up and running, well, the 10 million people caught in drought had, had morphed to 18 million. By the end of last year, humanitarian agencies were simply bouncing from one side of Afri Africa to the other on an annual basis as one food crisis was overrun by the next. I'd been twice to Western East Africa in four years. The third extreme weather event on the increase is floods. 
between Africa's droughts, I'd been in Pakistan two years running, 2010 and 2011, where on one occasion an area the size of England lay underwater and 20 million people had been affected by flooding. Some of Pakistan's poorest communities live on flood stock banks lining the Indus River, which flows the length of Pakistan. These communities are staggeringly vulnerable to flooding. They are bonded laborers under a feudal landholding system that sees individual families owning hundreds or even thousands of acres of land. They simply work for them. So if you overlay cyclones, droughts, and you add earthquakes, not perhaps so climate-related, this is the map. It's, that's droughts in orange, cyclones in green, earthquakes in purple. You get an indication of just how vulnerable the earth already is. And quite simply, it doesn't need us contributing to the problem. Not only are we living in an increasingly disaster-prone world, but we're also living in an increasingly full one. Consider the growth of the world's largest urban centres over 60 years. This is the layout of the world's largest cities in 1955, then in 2005, and then in 2015, two years from now. Tokyo and New York are joined by other new megacities, Shanghai, Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Dhaka, Mumbai, Karachi, cities which are far less resilient to disaster. I opened National Geographic this morning to find this on the cover. 136 large coastal cities, 40 million people, and $3 trillion is the cost now of rising sea levels. Partly as a result of the dense living um, costs, the, natural disaster, the cost of natural disasters to insurers in 2011 was 300 and $78 billion, and that was the highest recorded since 2005, and The Economist ran this two years ago. Let's bring it closer to home. Here in the Pacific, these are the cyclone paths over 53 years. We're told that a two degree temperature increase um, will intensify tropical cyclones by 15%. Higher intensity cyclones and storms will devastate atolls and low-lying coastal regions. Not only can they kill thousands, but they also unravel years or decades of development work. Fiji is a classic example. It's repeatedly hit with clean-up bills of over $50 million per cyclone. But something far more subtle was taking place in the Pacific. Sea level rise is gradually eating away at 75,000 kilometres of Pacific shoreline. In December last year, I was in Bougainville PNG, where the people of the um, Carteret Islands now live. In 2009, an entire community of 2,500 people had to relocate from their gorgeous islands 85 kilometres to the northeast. They moved to the small coastal town of Tumputs in Bougainville. These are two of the local boys. Their island had been lost to saltwater intrusion, making it impossible to cultivate crops or keep, fresh, or keep wells free of saltwater. With it goes their connection to their land, their ancestors and their unique cultural identity. The Carteret Islands may be worth nothing to anyone except those indigenous to it, but the direct cost of sea level rises in the Pacific is estimated to be worth 1.5 billion US dollars per year. Small island states are the most vulnerable, say the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Climate change threatens, threatens these states' long-term viability to feed themselves and their children. Climate change will flood their water tables with salt water, impacting their water for drinking and for crops. It will acidify their oceans, threatening plankton, reefs, mangrove forests. These are the foundations of marine life and fisheries. Together with failing crops, this will force more Pacific people from their islands. And they're not the ones causing the problem. It's Europe, North America, China, parts of South America, and Australasia, they didn't bother showing us on that map, who are creating the problems in those large orange bars. However, it's the poor in small island states and on large continents who can expect to bear the cost the black spots on this map show where the rises in surface temperatures are expected to be the greatest, and hence where much of the cost of climate change will be felt. Besides the polar cap, it's places like India, South Africa, the Sahel, and the Brazil's Amazon Basin who can expect to be most affected. Aid agencies are preparing for the worst. After the Asian 2004 tsunami, aid agencies geared up to handle two mega disasters a year, when you consider that each disaster can cost up to a billion dollars, that consumes a lot of staff and resource. Aid agencies are now trying to make a step change to handle four mega disasters. This is World Vision's map. In any one year, just to keep pace with the growing number of large catastrophes. Disaster response coordination is not an easy affair. This is the UN's Pacific Humanitarian Affairs Office in Fiji. 
uh, and um, this is part of the coordination for a, a tsunami response in Samoa and Tonga in 2009, and that was a small response. Do the poor need to change some of their practices? Well, yes. This is the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Haiti has stripped its forest bare to burn wood down into charcoal for cooking fuel. Charcoal simply adds to the cumulative pollutants impacting the atmosphere. The Dominican Republic, by contrast, cooks with gas. The world over development agencies are helping the poor to migrate to more fuel efficient, less polluting ways to cook. I was involved in putting these $10 stoves into Somali refugee camps to limit the amount of wood women needed to collect or burn. And besides the fact that wood was scarce, they were at risk of sexual assault from straying too far from the camps to collect it. The poor will also need to learn to adapt, and aid agencies like Tear Fund is helping them to do so. In the Solomons, in Fiji, Tear Fund is developing disaster risk reduction strategies with local communities and is introducing crops that can grow in saltier soil. In Mongolia, Tear Fund is helping nomad herders transition to cropping in settled agriculture after being forced from their open grazing sites by long, harsh winters. In the Philippines, Tear Fund is helping farmers diversify crops as the wet and dry seasons become far less predictable, resulting in entire crop losses to floods, cyclones, and landslides. They need rice varieties that can handle weeks of being entirely submerged, but the varieties on offer need fertilizers that will pollute the water table and ruin their long-term soil fertility. The poor can only do so much. Disasters are destroying the capacity of the poor to feed and provide for themselves. A single disaster wipes out decades of development gains. So even while fertility rates come down and stabilize across the developing world, food supply is under pressure. Growing seasons are ever shorter thanks to higher temperatures. And when you add in the impacts of floods, cyclones, soil erosion, encroaching deserts, and reduced soil fertility, the price of staple foods is now rising at double the pace that it would if all prices had to do was keep up with population growth. Freshwater access is a global emergency. A fifth of the population on Earth live on less water than it takes to flush a toilet. Declining water tables and salination of groundwater has a direct impact on crop yields, not to mention the time it takes the poor to walk to collect water, time that they could spend in education or in productive activities. In Peru, Lima, they are entirely dependent on water from glacial melt. The glaciers will be gone in 20 years. All their future options will be expensive energy intensive desalination or a pipeline to the Amazon River which itself is threatened by climate change. The sad irony is that we grow ever, as we grow ever richer in comparison to the poor, we have both the wealth to aid them in their development and the global carbon footprint to stamp that development out. Progress toward the end of poverty has been remarkable in the last 30 years, despite all the roadblocks thrown up by war, politics, population increase, but climate threat could unravel all of this. The same aid agencies like Tear Fund, who have fought for decades to get traction on development and to prepare poor countries for emergencies, end up back there when disaster strikes, and that's been my career for the last eight years. This simply perpetuates the humilia humiliating cycle of dependence. How can we assist Bangladesh to move out of poverty permanently if 20% of the country will be underwater within 50 years? Here in New Zealand, we may not cook with charcoal, we may not be sinking, our water table may not be disappearing, and we, may not, and we may already have a diversified food supply. But our greenhouse gas emissions are up by 22% from 1990. We are a nation of drivers wedded to our cars. We guzzle ever-increasing amounts of fossil fuels. 38% of New Zealand CO2 emissions are from road transport. We won't feel the impact, at least not right away but our Pacific and our Asian neighbors will. Africa will. We need to change. There is no planet B. It is an issue of justice. Those who play so little part in causing the problem bear so much of the consequence, while those like us who have benefited most from development pay so little. This is a fundamental injustice. The previous UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon put it this way, climate cha change affects us all, but it does not affect us all equally. We should stand in solidarity with the poor and we should stop contributing to the global environmental disaster. There is a lot of things an individual or a church cannot control, but this, our contribution to climate change, is one we can. Where we invest and how much we drive is under our control. 
So from Tear Fund, we think we should take a stand.